welcome to the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I'm your host, Peter. This week, we have Zach Ferentz of Felons. Hudson County, New Jersey's own Zach Ferentz is nothing if not an explorer. He'd gotten his start in the stalwart New Jersey hardcore band War Story. He then made his way to acoustic-based, folk-inspired singer-songwriter music with the incredible Ferentz and the Felons. From this point, he yearned for his own voice, his own musical identity. Adopting a more electronic bent, Felons became the ultimate proclamation of self-determination, pulling himself from a past rife with struggle and using it as both a fuel and a jacket. Felons pulls from every facet of his musical and emotional background, delivering a fully concentrated and distilled vision. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Felons on the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. How about now? Perfect. Yeah, I'm running through yeah. Scarlet too. No, I, I yep. love this thing, and man, it works really well. Yeah, super cool. Um, um, pretty incredible uh, that I ran across you on Instagram because, you know, like you, you, you see and hear a lot of musicians who are like, you know, they, they put out these great visuals, and you definitely do. I, I don't know who's responsible for that, the photography and your, your graphic design, but it's very eye-catching very reminiscent of like something god flesh would have done with like the you know the the grit element but uh you know the music backs it up in, in a in a pretty unique way and it, and it it reeks of authenticity i appreciate that everything you do reeks very much of authenticity in an almost uh hardcore slash hip-hop way okay. you know like it like it it, it it feels like you're a hardcore kid yeah i mean for sure that's where i got like a lot of my start at and um can you hear me because i can't hear me. yeah yeah i can okay, hear you cool. just fine you sound good all right perfect uh yeah that's where i got my start at you know it was like i i started off my older brother he's about six years older than me he got me into like slayer and and pantera and sepultura and shortly after, you know, he showed me bands like Biohazard, Madball, and uh, Agnostic Front. And, you know, it just went on from there where I really found my kind of roots in the hardcore scene because of, like, the situation that we had grown up in. And also, like, you know, just being on the streets more. Uh, a lot of metal kids, per se, weren't really much of street kids. They were just, like... It was different. The hardcore kids were street. You know, we would get a shaking on the street. We were hustling. We were doing our thing. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I appreciate you saying that because, you know, hardcore and, and, and even hip hop, like I'm wearing a little Wayne shirt right now, a throwback cool. Wayne shirt. Yeah. Um, yeah. The hip hop, too, was a big thing because, you know, just growing up in Hudson County, like. Well, they come from the same hip hop and hardcore come from the same place. Yeah, for sure. For like sure. For, completely like for you sure. can't really disseminate one from the other. That's why when Biohazard was popping off in a big way, Onyx was right there with them. Yep, yep. I mean, like, and it was the New York, New Jersey thing, you know, yeah. where like, like E Town was huge because they took the two things that we all kind of identified with and melded them together. Yep, yep. But um, you, your music, on the other hand, maybe the beats have a uh, maybe a hip hop adjacent flavor, but musically, it's it's all. Uh, it's not all electronic because there's definitely a punk element to it and, and an indie rock almost element to it, but it's very gritty driving. Yeah. And it sounds like you were sitting alone a lot listening to maybe like skinny puppy or ministry too, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, so what happened was I was playing in hardcore bands and, you know, doing the thing and, and it led to me stepping away from music for a little bit and, and realizing that, you know, it was such a big part of my life. I, I always wanted to be like a soul songwriter kind of, and just write a bunch of songs. So when my parents were still alive, 
I kind of created this like Ferrance and the Felons, like folk rock thing. And that had a lot to do with like, you know, growing up listening to like Neil Young and Tom Petty and Bob Dylan. And uh, it's kind of realizing I was making music for my parents and, and like that generation. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> both of my parents were uh, heavy into heroin. And so, you know, I, I was getting a lot of inspiration from their addiction and my upbringing with them. And uh, what had happened there was they passed away. You know, my mom uh, snorted like 50 something Xanax and my dad OD'd on fentanyl. And when that happened, uh, you know, I kind of was like, wait, I kind of want to make my own thing, you know, Mm -hmm. realized I was making music really for my parents and like showing them like, yo, they were, they were like my biggest fans at that point. Um, yeah, just when they passed, I was like, wait a minute, I got to take hardcore, the mindset of a hardcore kid, you know, the attitude of a hip hop dude, Mm -hmm. the, the songwriting skill of a folk writer. Yep. And the, the modern technology of like, you know, an electronic artist and kind of blend them together. And yeah, I did it without thinking about it, you know, and pulled it the fuck off because it's all like everything you just said is everything I've written down right here. I mean, because there's definitely a Springsteen uh, uh, singer songwriter vibe to your lyricism, maybe not to the delivery so much. I mean, you're a great singer, but Bruce is not, he's an orator, (laughs) but he's a songwriter and a storyteller and you're a, you're a songwriter and storyteller. And it, it coming from someone who uh you know i i've been in and out of you know rehab and na and all of that it speaks to me in a very specific and visceral way because i recognize a lot of the shit out of respect man yeah. you, you know what i mean i i know i know those those alleyways and avenues uh, i guess you could say and and that's what that's what kind of really drew me as well it's like even the name felons it's like yeah yeah, yeah. We're just a bunch of felons, you know, we're like, you know, it's funny with me because I had caught a felony when I was younger um, and that's the only felony I got. But so people will say, oh, you're a felon. And I only was ever like incarcerated one time. It, it took me like, you know, getting arrested once to be like, yo, this shit's for the birds. Um, yeah, I wasn't a dude who was like in and out of programs. But <clears throat> my parents like I mean, my dad's been locked up probably over 100 times. My mom did time. My best friends did time. You know, I've gotten arrested. My, my brother's gotten arrested. You know, we, it was just like, yo, we're all felons in a sense where, like, we're just kind of outcasts. And, yeah, I mean, someone like you saying that you connected with my music is cool because I think, like, I connected with you in a sense in some, like, spiritual way. Because mm-hmm. I connect with everybody that comes from that struggle, you know? So, you know, just props to you for saying that, you know, you went through that and, you know, really pushed out of it because... I don't like the rap that addicts get, you know, I don't like the rap that, uh, you know, people who, who do drugs and, and drink get because at the end of the day, man, I mean, I'm addicted to sugar. 95% of the people are addicted to sugar, foods, chemicals, yeah. this garbage shit we're consuming, but we're so quick to be like, oh, this dude's on dope. You know, he's a junkie. That, and, that's the junkie. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Got you're it. the junkie, but the, but the guy who's like, you know, sucking 40 sodas down a day. He's just a normal dude who's just going about his life. So I think we're all struggling in a sense and, and we need to be there for each other and we need to stop casting people out. And that's a big thing with felons. You know, the whole movement, the whole mindset is, is you know, to, to really bring light to dark situations and show that they're beautiful, you know, and they're the new shit's a little weird, you know, I don't know. I'm rambling right now. No, the new shit, the, your new shit. Um, I, I, I love the direction you're going because it, it I, I don't want to call it post-punk, but it fits in really well with a lot of that post-punk vibe that's happening right now, but it's it's a lot grittier. Okay. You know what I mean? It, it's got a lot more street to it. The only other the only other group out there that's taking something like like post-punk, like ex hardcore kids doing post-punk music, but adding that hip hop element is soft kill. Everybody else they're doing their thing and it's good, but felons and soft kill are the two groups that are really repping that in a, in a, in a big and unique way. And you two don't sound alike. You're just coming okay. from the same place. Okay. I got to check it out. Soft kill. I got to check that yeah. out for sure. You're going to like it. 
you're gonna yeah, like it. yeah yeah for sure man i mean that's that's uh what happened with me with the hardcore thing was you know growing up and, and listening to like like you know i got a mad ball tat on my hand i yeah i grew up listening to urban discipline and, and e-town concrete and I mean, I guess what happened was I, those were my guys. Those were the guys I looked up to in a sense, like, all right, you know, I want to make music like this. And then when I got to the scene, I got, I always said, you know, I, me and my brother always joked and said, yeah, I got, we got into hardcore too late, man. By the time we got into hardcore, it was like a bunch of suburban kids yeah. yelling about, yelling about the streets and shit. And it didn't make no sense to me. And, um, you know, I had my ego. My ego was in the way with certain bands that were doing their thing at the time. And, I, you know, I was like, yo, these kids are like, they ain't hardcore. You know what I mean? They never, like, yeah. shanked nobody and really put in work on the streets and, you know, had that that anxiety that comes with, with hustling and, 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 you know, carrying a strap on you or a knife, you know. So I was like, I was a little bitter towards, like, some bands getting shine. I remember... I'm not going to drop any band names, but like we played a show dudes pulled up in BMWs. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is this? Like this ain't hardcore to me, man. But no, nah. turns out, like I said, you know, everybody's got their time to shine and no pun intended, but everybody's, <laughs> got, everybody's got their time to shine. I was just a little bitter and needed to go through my own journey. And that's why I came out the other side doing felons. And it's been going cool, man. Cause the hardcore community shows me love and, yeah, that's that's fucking awesome. They're the best, you know. Well, I mean, we real hardcore kids anyway. We 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 know bullshit and we know real. Yeah, and yeah. We, we will call it, and you know, it it won't be so much in words. It'll be in consumption. So the people who recognize real, they're going to listen. They're going to buy your merch. They're going to yeah, yeah. represent it. You know, in, in yeah, a really sure. sincere way. Exactly, man. You know, and that's. Like I said, that's why it, it caught me. And I mean, shit, my I caught my first and only felony when I was 16 years old. There I never, go. I never did it again. But I also graduated high school in a, you know, in a in a youth detention center. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in a similar. I got arrested. I was like 17. I caught an assault charge. That's and what then I had. <laughs> they had they had me plead guilty to 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 assault, and I didn't know at the time. They were like, look, this is going to go on your record and stuff. So. It, you know, I didn't know I was about to turn 18. So I just was like, I don't want to go back to the youth house. So anything to not do that, um, you know, but it is what it is. That's part of the journey. That's part of our story. And I, you know, learned from it again. And I, and I wasn't done with the street shit after that. I did a lot of stupid shit, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. should have probably got locked up a hundred more times, but the cops can't catch me. You know what I mean? So well, yeah, you like, get caught once and you figure out what to do not to get caught. I mean, that's the lesson you learn. <laughs> yeah, I got snitched on. That's how I got caught. But, I mean, that's cool, too. Like, I, I'm not – fuck, I'll never snitch in my life. That's just not in my code. But, no, you know, the kids who snitched on me, they weren't built for that shit. They were just – that was their own insecurity. And, you know, it is what it is. I didn't retaliate on them or nothing. I was like, I ain't trying to get jammed up again, so – but the, the the crazy thing is now, like, just getting on that topic is, like, we're living in a world where, like, snitching's cool and shit and, like, all this yeah. shit's getting glorified and, like, dudes yeah. are running around here. I snitched and I'm like, what the fuck? Catch yeah, a how, bullet. How in the actual fuck can hip-hop artists, and we both know who I'm talking about, how could you not only lie about gang affiliations but then snitch on a bunch of motherfuckers and then come out and talk about it and write hip hop songs about it and still be all right it's with so your multicolored it, teeth and your, yeah. and your like, come on, dude. You know what it is, man, the, the industry will sell anything to anybody. And, and that's why, you know, I stick to the street code of things of like, do it yourself. The hardcore way of DIY. It's the best thing I got from hardcore was DIY. Yeah. yeah, I mean, put your head up in the air, be confident. You know what I mean? I'm confident with what I'm doing, you know, and, and I, I wish everybody success, you know, even motherfuckers who hate on me, whatever. I don't care. It's irrelevant that those people, it's none of my business what people think about me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to run around here and like promote this like tattletale mentality and it's, it's, it's drama. And that's the shit I was seeing in the scene I was in when the hardcore scene was popping. I'm seeing kids who I'm like, yo, these kids are soft. You know what I mean? They're they're gonna tell. They're gonna they're gonna do this stupid shit. 
I mean, growing up where I grew up, if you snitched, you know, what I mean, you got dealt with. So it was like, yeah. it was like, yeah, I'd rather go to the go away a thousand times before coming back out on the street and getting certified as a snitch. Oh, and, my, yeah. and my pops did a lot of time, and he was that was a big no no for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Every time somebody got arrested in our neighborhood, you know, my pops was first ear to the ground, like. Why are they out so quick? Why, you know, yeah. like he was like, "Yo, I want to see paperwork." You know what I mean? Docket party him, yeah, yeah, yeah. My pops was big on that shit. So even when my pops died, funny story, man. My pops died. Uh, he was OD'd. Not that that's funny, but you know, he's a legend. He's living in another dimension now. You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah, and that's he, real. He, he OD'd and shit. And I came in, and my sister took it really hard. She was really tight with my dad, even though he was he had his fucked up ways with us. My my sister took a real big like connection with him yeah, and so sister, i saw my sisters do do that though the sisters do yeah, my dad could do my all dad. my dad could do all the fucking bad in the world <laughs> and my sister's like don't leave him alone and blah, blah. yeah so yo when my mom's passed my dad took it really hard because you know they got high together their whole life they ran the streets together so to see you know your girl i mean i can only imagine if my girl passed before me that'd be tough right yeah I couldn't so my dad it. took it hard but he had nowhere to live because he was technically homeless so my sister was She's doing pretty well for herself. She set him up, got him an apartment. You know, I, I was helping him a lot financially. We were taking care of him. We were like, even a well, long story short, when he passed, my sister was in no shape to deal with cops. You know, when cops came in the door and, you know, they're there. And I'll never forget, like, the cops come up to me and they're like, hey, you know, we found like eight bags of dope on him, you know, and we think that, you know, you know, he, he OD'd. I'm like, yo, obviously. <laughs> And so the cops like his phone's ringing, you know, and we can't technically pick it up. You own it, but we think you know maybe you could help us. I said, man, listen, real quick. I said, my man, old man's dead right there. I said, if, if I even pick that fucking phone up, my pops will wake up one last time, fucking stab me in the neck. I said, yeah, we weren't bred that way, man. I don't really do deals with the police and shit. And I'll never forget, man. He, the cop was cool. He was like, yo, I got you, yo. You know what I mean? I already know you guys are on the street side. Yeah. So then this other like rookie cop comes up like 20 minutes later and he's like selling me this whole story of you really don't want to take down the guy who killed your dad. I said, man, listen, bro, my dad killed my dad. Yeah, that's the name of the fucking game with the streets. And that's what people got to understand. And I know now we're going into the street talk, but my pops yeah. and mom told me if you're going to go do the street shit, you better, you know, you do the crime, you better be prepared to do the time. Well, you got to live it. You can't just you can't just wear that jacket without living it. Yeah, you like, can't do it. You know, what I mean, I got caught. What my charge was like, you know, me and my boys, my boy got jumped. We had went to a party and, and you know, fucked a few people up. And I had hit this kid and his head hit the ground. He went into a coma. Yeah, he, he was all fucked up. And so, you know, when I was like in, in the youth house, they were saying basically like, yo, this kid might not make it. You're going to get charged with manslaughter, blah, blah, blah. Selling me all the bullshit. And I remember I was like, yo, I told the whoever you talk to when you first get incarcerated, I said, yo, listen, man, if that's the case, then I'm fucking in here. There ain't nothing I could do. You know what I mean? Yep. This is home for now then. It sucks to say that. I called my pops on the phone and he's like, fuck it, you're in there now, motherfucker. You're a tough guy. You know what I mean? You're going to see what this shit's about. So, you know, he gave me tough love and, yeah. and, and that's it. But we're on a tangent now about the streets, but people got to know, man, this is real. This is real. Well, this is real life. And that's, that's basically kind of sort of how it went down for me as well. I mean, I was, I was running around with my cousin. My cousin is, you know, he's not a white person. <laughs> and, and the, to the Nazi skinheads who were in my orbit, you know, in this area, not so cool. Where and are you from? I'm from the Scranton area of Pennsylvania. Oh, Scranton. Okay. Don't yeah. worry. So uh, we're in Southside Scranton, uh, which is a predominantly Mexican neighborhood. It is my original neighborhood. Okay. And there's a bunch of Nazis in town from Allentown for Life of Agony. Life okay. of Agony show at CeCe's. And my band was playing. I had my cousin with me. We were at a convenience store just getting what we needed. You know, probably, you know, blunts and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And they walked up on us. I, I had a, a 1964 Tempest, big boat of a vehicle. And they were calling me what you would call a white person who hangs around with people who aren't white to a bunch of Nazis. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I was, I was chemically enhanced 
as as was the case back in 1992 uh, for me and i said you know what fuck these guys and i just put it in drive and hit the gas and ran the motherfucker over fuck them and fuck them <laughs> and i got caught yeah it's and 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 the way it went down was real simple it's i i didn't even make it to the show the police showed up within 15 seconds yeah i w- i was got and two years later i got out and that was it okay so and, you did two years and, and okay well they kept i was very lucky because it was 1992 and they were not charging us as adults in pennsylvania yet okay otherwise that's attempted murder you'd have been that, gone i'd have been gone we yeah, wouldn't you'd be have done some time i i may not have gotten out because like 15 years could be life you, yeah, you know what I mean? You never know how long you're going to even live inside. So, yeah. But I mean, you know, again, that's the street shit. You know, I've been in situations where my, I was in a whip with my boy and we tried running somebody over, similar situation. And, you know, just crazy nights like that where, like you said, they're drug induced or they're alcohol induced. And the night I got locked up, man, I was, I was drinking that night and I was sniffing a little bit of blow too, to be honest. You know what I yeah. mean? And, and, I'll never forget my boy came in the crib. He was leaking. He was all beat up. He's like, yo, I just got jumped. And uh, I remember I snorted a fat rail. And mm-hmm. I was like, yo, let's go do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when you're in that mindset, you're not, you know, I'm, I'm swinging on everybody that I don't recognize. I, I, yeah. I That night I swung on people I was cool with because I was just out of it. But. Oh, yeah. You're licking your own ears at that point. You don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. You know? You know? And, and that's just me being honest with with myself and I, honestly man short after that i stopped doing like drugs and i stopped doing blow and i stopped you know maybe fucking around with some ecstasy and shit like that and i i even cut out smoking bud and drinking because i was like damn yeah i want to straighten my shit out i want to be successful i don't want to be like my parents and you know my my uncles and all the people i grew up around i want to show them like you know i don't want to make them think they failed you know yeah and one of the scariest not the scariest, but one of the shittiest moments of my life was when I got caught in a real heavy situation with some heavy dudes. And I was talking to my mom and my mom started crying and she's like, yo, I failed as a parent. You know what I mean? Like I did this. I should have been. And I was like, damn, yo, I don't want my mom to feel this way. You know what I mean? She did the best she could. And that's when I was like, yo, I'm straightening my fucking life up, man. And I, I'm, I'm going to do this music shit. And, or, you know, I started doing like security and working a real job and, Eventually started my own business and I was like, yeah, I want to, I could proudly say I took care of my, my brother and my sister and me took care of our parents till the day they passed. And for three kids who had nothing, yo, I mean, we, we, we did what we could. So, yeah, you know, I'm big on the turnaround story. That's, that's a big thing for me, man. Like you turned your life around. I tip my hat to that. Yeah. I, I want to hear your dark story. Cause I want, I want to know that the light's coming too. Oh, so, it, Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's really cool when people open up and tell their story and you know really get to the truth about themselves because we're all we're all we all make mistakes, man. We all we all fuck up. It's part of life and it, it's beautiful in a sense too. It well, it's a part of the journey. I mean, if if you just went through this very uh just like white bread trajectory of like Hey, yeah, I went to high school, then I went to college, then I got married, then this happened, then that happened. It's like, I don't know who your fairy godmother is, but I didn't have her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I did I... go and I did go to college and I did do all that shit, but I did it while I was a fucking heroin addict. Okay, so, so you were I don't doing know, you were I doing was, heroin too? Yeah, I was I was doing dope. I was I was right. on and off with dope that that obsession of addiction for uh probably 13 years oh wow okay yeah that's that's uh you know i really i really uh relate to people who who are addicted to opiates i i never actually i've done like a few percocets when i was younger like stupid shit you know yeah but i never got caught up in that whirlwind thankfully because of my parents really you know really going down that rabbit hole and uh you know my pops was doing dope for 50 plus years my mom was doing dope for 40 plus years so I had really saw the dark side of that shit. But what I will say is the most, my best friend in the world, my right hand man, he's clean now four years, five years. He was heavy in the dope, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, 
the thing I'll say about addicts, specifically opiate addicts that I knew, yo, they're some of the most like heartfelt, like deep emotional people. Like they're really, really loving people. They just, they, they it's so tough. It's like they're, they're usually the nicest, kindest people and then they're suffering the hardest. Yeah. So I always love talking to people who battled that because you seem like a heartfelt dude too, you know? And and that's and that's the beauty about that that fucking drug. As much as it's fucked up, we do have opioid receptors in our body, you know? Yeah, we're born with all of the we're born with receptors for all of that. Exactly. Yeah, you know. Otherwise the chemical wouldn't have that effect on our brains. And you know, it's like DMT. People smoke DMT now. That's endemic to the body. Exactly. Your body produces that shit. So, yeah, yeah, man, I was watching a whole thing with Wim Hof, the, the dude who does all the breathing techniques. He's super inspirational. Yeah. And he talks about how, like, through breathing, you could actually, like, create, like, an opioid reaction. And, you know, I remember being younger and asking my dad. My dad said to me, he's like, yo, you want you want to smoke bud, smoke bud. And, you know, he would get me bud. Even when I was, like, doing a little bit of blow when I was, like, 16, 17, he's like, you know, he's like, I'll get you to blow because I could get you some good shit. And, and most yeah. people would think that's fucked up. Nah, Here's I... this dad getting this kid blow. But my dad didn't want me to snort no stupid shit. Yeah, and you, he's, you, he knows you're going to do it anyway. My old man yeah. did the same kind of shit, too. I mean. Yeah. It... But he's like, uh, he's like, uh, I guess we blow. He said, yo, but listen, when it comes to the heroin shit, he said, if you do that shit, you might as well put a burner to your head. You know, yeah. he's like, look at me, man. Look at your mother. You know what I mean? You're going to. That's going to be a dragon you you ain't going to be able to beat. So I listened to him, those conversations, you know. I saw my mom, sh you know, do dope in front of me a lot. So every time, I, you know, I saw that, she would say, yo, promise me you never do this shit. And I always told her I'll never do it. But again, I'm grateful I had them. I always say my parents took an L for us, you know. They took the L for us so that we didn't have to go down that road. I'm very grateful for them. Yeah. So it's, and they, uh, they didn't love you any less because of it. Nah, they love shit. They were the coolest people in the world. I had a lot of hard years with them, you know, because mm -hmm. obviously sometimes they chose that shit over us. But, you know, knowing them, they were fucking really cool, down to earth people. And they let us do whatever the fuck we want. When I, when I was six, when I was like 15, I was like, yo, I wasn't going to school. I didn't go to school since I was like 13. My dad said, fuck that school shit, man. You don't want to go to school? Don't go to school. I'll sign you the fuck out. And I'll never forget. He goes, but you got to figure it the fuck out. I mean, we ain't got no money. So I got a job at a Christmas tree factory. I was working in a Christmas tree factory. That was like my first official job. I used to do all types of odds and ends shit since I'm like a pup. When yeah. I was like nine, I used to go out shoveling snow. I used to make bread. So my, my, my dad, I always told my dad right before he passed, he said, yo, you, you make it doing well for yourself. I said, yo, pops, you, you created a little entrepreneur because you, know, you showed me how to hustle and make money, you know, knocking on doors, asking people. I remember I used to fucking sell lemonade stands and shit outside the projects. So I think uh, school could be a little misleading for people and kind of turn them into a lemming. Um, I'm grateful I, I just went into the to the entrepreneur field, you know. Is, and that's kind of like what leads you into the way you the way you kind of function with felons too, because I mean, like you guys got it set up like like it's your own little streetwear label. Yeah, it is. You, you know what I mean? Because you got your shirts, you got you got all your branded like like sweatshirts, t-shirts, you got yep. balaclavas, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was always that way, man. It, it, you know, for me, shout out to my team too, because I got a great team when we were we're contemplating the name right now. We want to give our our great team a little name, you know, because we're rocking as a group. Yeah. But shout out to my brother Plancham. He he's my producer. He's actually a really, really fucking awesome dude. And um, super talented. Shout out my boy Cybercreep from the Ukraine. He's out in Jersey City now, but he's uh, he's nasty. He does a lot of the animation shit you see. And oh, all right, all right. Because yeah, he's got yeah. some eye catching shit he's doing right he's now. He's crazy. We we actually um, me and him are working on a couple projects for some hardcore bands too. So we're doing some cool shit together. And then um, that's like those guys are like two of my best friends. And then shout out my my brother. My boy Flora, he's my right hand man. He helps me with everything. And then uh, Rob Duds, he's he's part of the musical end of it. And then my boy Blanco too helps me a lot with the visuals. So we got like a little team right now. We're just we're doing it our own way, you know, DIY. Like 
you know, not really looking for a label and we're like, yo, we're the label, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're better off that way. And all the bands I've been talking to the past four or five, six months, nobody nobody really even wants to fuck with a label right like right now because what could a label do for you take money off of you yeah i mean lock into a 360 deal where they're getting part of your tour part of your merch like no 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 as long as you know how to move correctly on social media you don't need it yeah and 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 i think like you said being honest and you know i i don't have much experience with labels i've had a few people approach me with other projects like yo maybe we could sign a deal put out an ep or a record and i was always like eh, like i don't want nobody owning my vision so that's just a personal thing i mean i'm sure it, it could work out great for some artists and hey maybe down the road we could partner on some shit with a label but the thing about labels are about the 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 obsession with artists just wanting to get signed it yeah. was always like weird to me. It was like, I don't really, I never wanted to sign a contract. Dude, when do you want to sign a contract? Never. You're no. like, I don't want to sign no paperwork. Get this shit away from me. Especially the world we come from. That's everything that we learned was from Ian Mackay and, you know, <laughs> Discord happened in his house. That was him. Yeah, exactly. So you think of like, you know, talking with the dudes at Madball or, you know, AF and, just chopping it up with them and you know telling them like oh this is my idea this is my they're like bro no shit like that's the way to do it and you know shout out manball really man i mean i i befriended those dudes and and really just awesome guys and oh yeah really really pioneers to this shit and and af as well and all those bands sick of it all but specifically manball you know i mean they're they they're take us they they stand up for what their shit's about and they keep it real. And every time I think about doing some like maybe funny shit where like somebody makes me an offer, oh, I could get you in a room with this dude. I'm like, and I'll just like think of like Madball and be like, nah, I'm good. Like, well, you know. cause right now Madball, they're on their own label and nuclear blast just distributes it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly what their deal is. It might be something it's, like that. It, that's what it is because oh, they're okay. on black and blue records. That's their record label. And yeah, they run their shit in house. They ain't stupid. Nuclear blast just pushes it throughout the world for them, and yeah, that's man. why they can get Lars from Rancid to produce albums for them, and just you know, like they're writing their own ticket right now. Yeah, they're doing it, and 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 that's you know that's, I think it takes a lot more courage and a lot a lot bigger balls to to really take a stand and do it yourself and. You know, speak out on the things they speak out against. I'm really, I really respect them for that. And, and, you know, like I said, they're a big influence on me. You know, it's like I might not be making music that sounds like Madball because at the end of the day, man, Madball's Madball. I don't want to be yeah. Madball. Yeah. Freddie's been wanna... doing that band since he was 13. That's his identity. Yeah. I want to be felons, but I, I could really just tip my hat and respect the OGs that did this shit before me. I, I remember I was talking to one of them, I forget who, but. We were talking about AF, and I said, "Yo, my favorite AF record's Another Voice." That's me being honest because I'm I'm 31 or 32, I think. Yeah, I forget what hell yeah. I am, but <laughs> I I remember when Another Voice came out. Jamie Josta produced it, and I was heavy in the Hate Breed, and I was like, "Yo, this." I'm wearing my Hate Breed flannel right now. Dixie, yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Hate Breed was a big gateway band for me, and I remember saying, like, you know. AF that AF record slapped, and then I really fucked with Warriors. Because Freddie produced Warriors, and I was I think I was talking to Hoya or Freddie, one of them, and they said, "Yo, that's really cool that you think that record's the coolest because that you know most kids are going to try to say another voice, but it's like or or, or one voice, one voice, or, or yeah, United blood, and it's like, bro, I didn't live in that era. I don't know that era. See, that that's when I when I first heard AF was was that era of it because I'm 45. Okay, dude. well, you look young, bro. I look yeah, like yeah. Holy I, shit. I, I, I lucked out in that, except for my hairline, which I'm hiding really well. Fuck right that. You put that. a hat on, I'm a freaking yeah. 25, man. Holy <laughs> shit. Uh, but, you know, in 19, like, 86, I heard the 7-inch, and that was that was my gateway. But if you want to talk about songwriting, you're right on. You're right on the money. Yeah, that yeah. era is their best, like, right around actually right around when they got on to hellcat records okay epitaph that's when they started really writing and then what you're talking about that's like that's the right. apex because they're taking they're taking the metallic end and the punk rock stuff and 
smacking yeah. it together and going, you know. And I hope I, Roger's all right right now because Roger was fighting for a while there for, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I think he's doing pretty good. I mean, he's still he's a warrior. You know what I mean? These guys have been through it all. And I saw Stigma recently at uh in New York, and he's he's doing all right too. He's hanging in there. But when you think about it, it's it's for me with AF. I'm not even gonna front. I only listen to something's got to give up. You know, mm -hmm. I listen to like something's got to give. Another voice, warriors, my life, my way, uh, all the new shit. I, I still jock it heavy because that's mm -hmm. my era. And like, why not be honest? Even with Madball, like, I'll be straight up, set it off, and and demonstrate probably the albums I listen to least. I love them; they're great records. But my favorite record by Madball is probably like Legacy. Legacy Legacy's is mine too. Yeah, Legacy or like Empire. And then mm -hmm. I'm a little bit biased to hold it down because it was recorded in Jersey City. But, you know, fuck, dude. I thought Hardcore Lives was great. Like, I like a lot of the newer shit. So I'm excited for, you know, the record they put out next for sure. Well, they're recording that. Like, I think they're done recording it. They're just mixing it now. Yeah, I don't know exactly where they're at with it. But, I mean, I know it's going to slap. They definitely got a lot of shit to say. Yeah. But bands like Hatebreed, I remember I was, I was with them since Satisfaction. So, like, those are obviously my records, like the first three. Yeah. But, um, yo, another big record I just want to say for me, man, hardcore record, was Sworn Enemy is Real as It Gets. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. Shout out to Sal and, and, and Lorenzo and all them dudes. That record is fucking up there, man. That's one of my favorites, man, for sure. Well, that's that nine. That's the 9-11 record. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, you know? He talks about it a little bit. But that, that record's fucking intense, man. But I was no. going to say, aside from that, my bad to cut you off, but no, go ahead. the thing that got me experimental were some bands, really bands I love a lot are uh, Candiria and oh, uh, yeah. and Dillinger Escape Plan. Yeah. They were they were bands where I was like, oh, wait, you could be a fucking weirdo, too. So when you listen to like a lot of the felons and you say like, you know, you could kind of hear that industrial dude, a lot of that came from like some of the later Dillinger records or like Candiria records where they were doing some like real experimental shit. I was feeling that too, man. Oh yeah. So, I mean like Candiria, where else are you going to find a hardcore band that incorporates hip hop and jazz? Yeah. And like crazy you know? ass, like fusion timing and it's, it's not, they're awesome, man. They're one of, to me, they're one of the greatest bands of all time. The like, both of the both of those bands because you have two of the greatest drummers ever to oh, do it. Forget it. To Ken do it. Shock and Chris yeah. Penny, and then even the kid Billy Reimer that Dillinger had toward the end. That kid ripped. They all ripped. You know. Yeah. And, and then you think of like Greg Frontman of Dillinger, like that dude's a fucking lunatic. So you got a really cool like Carly Coma man. I, Carly I was a sicko. Yeah, I remember seeing those like early like de like brian process of self-development and like seeing like them on the brooklyn rooftop and shit with the yankee hats like those are some of the my favorite promos ever like early candiria promo photos those some... dudes used to play here play in my area three blocks from my house on a bi-weekly basis they would drive yeah. into the scranton area and play here they were like a local band even though they're from new york yeah dope man you remember god forbid too they were oh like, yeah yeah that Jersey was producing New York and Jersey were obviously producing bangers all the time. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to live. I live in Hudson County, so I just jump on the path train and be right in the city. Mm -hmm. So I used to go see all those fucking bands right in uh, right in downtown Manhattan or Brooklyn, and yo, know, it was wild, super wild. So it's cool, man. It's cool that I can relate with the hardcore kids like you, because some people hear my music and now and they're you know they're like oh this is really cool and i'm like damn man, i used to go to shows and like fucking wow they would have no idea yeah like the type of shit i really love uh, I, I don't really it to me it's obvious that i mean the, okay that's cool though the basis of comparison the through line's real obvious but i i would have sworn having listened to it that you also had like a soft spot for like apex twin and you oh, know that's something awesome like you that. Say that hell yeah i mean yo shout out my brother cyber creep like He's heavy with Aphex. He fucking loves Aphex. Probably one of his favorite artists. And yeah, man, I mean, I was a big Dillinger fan and Dillinger covered Aphex. And, yeah, come to daddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yo, just seeing how Aphex operates. Like, I was talking to my boy Cybercreep about that the other day. Like, how Aphex operates. I'm like, yo, I love, like, I almost want to operate that way because he does whatever the fuck he wants. Like, 
Yep. He writes he his own give- ticket. Yeah, that dude's fucking super. He's super hardcore. In my eyes, that's a hardcore dude. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Apex is legendary. So, yeah, I respect you saying that because that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, yo, imagine taking like Apex and like hardcore and like, you know, maybe some like R&B influence a little bit, you know, trying to give it that well, urban feel. The the vocals have a, a very, very R&B Motown, Motown R&B feel. Okay, yeah, dope. Nah, now, yeah. Maybe maybe not like a modern R and B because some of that I could really take or leave, but Motown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know some old school shit. Yeah, I, I'm a, one of my favorite artists of all time is BB King. Yeah, I, I play a lot of blues guitar. So like, you know, for me, that's that's my world. I, you know, the urban thing is something I didn't want to leave behind. And when I was doing folk music a lot of the audience that I was performing in front of, they were really good people, but I don't know if they fully got what I was doing because I was playing in front of a bunch of like middle upper class, like, you know, folks that just, you know, Hey, I go to work every day. And I, I was like, damn, you know, I'm talking about like being on the street, my parents doing dope. Uh, and that's when I like rebranded felons and started like, yo, let's put some hip hop drums in here. And like, Let's like, you know, let's let's get some like different culture going cuz I mean, I grew up in a building with probably like we our projects were three floors and then you had like six buildings, so it mm-hmm. took up two blocks. So you figure like out of like 130 apartments, there was probably like four white families, you know? So but all my brothers and sisters growing up on the street, we were all all different colors and shapes and sizes and I'm very proud to say Hudson County is the most diverse county in, in America, yo. So it's it's no it's, shit. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really cool to say I'm from that, man. You know, it would be Polish motherfuckers, black, Haitians, Dominican, <laughs> and, and we all we all ride together. So um, I didn't want to leave my my city and my culture behind with like playing in front of like you know suburban people. That which wasn't my thing. See where where I'm from, like the the most culturally diverse place in my neighborhood is my house just my house okay (laughs) because my 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 wife is black grew up in the dominican republic our son is mixed i'm an irish Polak, and then we're surrounded we're in the we're in pittston pittston is where they made the movie the irishman about Okay, yep, yep, yep. If you saw that about yeah, about of course. that this is mafia central. So it's a bunch of Italian people and then us. Okay. <laughs> there you go, man. There you go. But like it sounds like where you're where you're from, like people would consider that like, you know, uh maybe not crime central, but definitely a dangerous place. And in all actuality, you're looking at a diaspora of of human experience. You're looking at everything all at once moving together in unison what what could be so awful about that in reality out, outside of the fact that you know everybody is on top of each other you know what i always said man and it's funny man because race is obviously a big topic always in the world and i hate even identifying as a race i i i i, I, do too. I really think we're all equal and we're all just living i think we're all the same being on some deeper like psychedelic shit i think we're all the same being sharing collective energy but we are exactly but to get into it like when i was young i knew racism was so corny because every girl i i wanted to sleep with a girl no matter what color she was it didn't matter what yeah i thought every style of girl was sexy i used to tell my boys man how could you like, this is how you know racism's corny, man. I like Asian girls. I like Arabic girls. I like black girls. I like white. And we were all dying laughing. And my yeah. buddy, my buddy Mouse, he's from Harlem. You know, he's a black dude. He's from Harlem. He would say, man, Zach, you know, I love all women. So you're right. Like, it, it never yeah. it never clicked to me. Like, you know what I mean? That shit was just like, why, like my girl is uh, Puerto Rican, you know? So mm-hmm. she uh, she grew up on the Lower East Side. And her grandmother's as dark as my T-shirt. You know, she's yeah. black. She's black. So it's like. I don't give a fuck, you know. Like, what does that shit matter? Like, it's... Yeah, like the person to talk to about that would be uh, Danny Singer, Danny Diablo. Oh yeah, I mean, Isaac. Yeah, Isaac's mom, uh, like dark Puerto Rican. Yeah, she's Puerto Rican. Yep, he's Isaac, a Jew. He's a Jew. He's too. a Jew, and his his dad was a Jewish cop, and he's related to the uh, 
the great Jewish poet, the great Jewish poet, Isaac Bashevis Singer. Oh shit, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Danny's Danny's from uh Jewish royalty, straight up. Straight oh, up. And you know, like growing up in something like that, you know, you're you're not gonna know what racism is until somebody shows it to you and stuffs it down your throat. Exactly. exactly. You know what I mean? And and that's what happens to all of us. I mean, none of us are born that way. No, none no one's born, born that way. No, we're born innocent, man. We just want to like, you know, I, I had, we're little, we don't care what color somebody is. We want to play and we want to have fun. Yeah. And then we get poisoned by the media and by the news. That's the shit that's going on in the world every day to this day. They're mm -hmm. separating us with this virus. They're separating us with these politics. They're separating us with fucking colors and shapes and genders and all that. Man, look, I don't give a fuck what you want to do with your life. Go do it. Yeah. You know, and, and I used to say, like, as long as you're not hurting nobody, go do it. I don't even give a fuck if you're hurting people. That's your prerogative. You yeah. ain't going to hurt me, bitch. Just don't I'll hurt fuck, me. I'll fuck you up, man. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. You know, but, like, my thing is, yo, we're all... We're all learning on this plane. So, you know, I don't play into the media and all that shit. I hate that shit, man. And I, I've i spewed my thoughts out like fuck politics. And now I'm just like, oh, I hate that shit. But mm -hmm. going back to you talking about uh, Isaac, Danny Diavo, I want to say that when I had this band War Story, mm -hmm. um, Danny Diablo was the first fucking dude to really put us on, man. He was oh, shit. He was the realest motherfucker, man. I met him somehow. I forget how. I met him. I obviously knew him. I was Crown of Thorns. I fucked with Crown of Thorns. Yeah. And I fucked with Scarhead. And I met him at like a party and I was talking to him. He was living in, in, in out in Jersey at the time where I was at. And I was like, yo, I think I saw him in Jersey. And I was like, yo, I got this band, blah, blah. And he was as real as they come. He was like, oh, you got a hardcore band? Like, yo, I'm, I'm putting on a show. I'll put you guys on. Yo, never even heard us. Never even knew what the fuck we sounded like. Didn't yeah. even know if we could play our instruments. I mean, we were good. We could play. But he put us on, like, you know, one of his shows with all these Crown of Thorns was playing, a bunch of dope bands. And I would, I want to say, man, that dude's as real as they come. And, and all those black and blue dudes that I met through that world, they're all real. They all – yeah, they give you a shot right away. So, you know, to see – to see the hardcore family like growing and still, you know, you wear an H2O hat, everybody yeah. still rocking with hardcore. It's awesome, man. It's the best, it's the best community I've ever been a part of in the music world. And I'll never abandon it. Even if I'm doing something different, I'll shoot my promo shirts with a fucking sick of it all hoodie on. I'll, 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 I'll say in an interview that my biggest influences are fucking mad ball and, and, and slayer. I'm, I, I, it's where I come from, you know? Yeah, it's, it's what I come from. So, and what's great about that that whole end of the spectrum is they're not just gonna disseminate and be like, okay, you don't sound like this, so you're not that. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Like because those dudes, like look at look at uh, Scott Vogel from Terror. His favorite band's Hot Water Music. Yeah, hell yeah, Chuck Reagan, good dude yeah, too. Yeah, Chuck, oh, Reagan's, dude, Chuck Reagan's a fucking beautiful human being. He bailed me out of a bad situation in Philly once, as a matter of fact. But um, like these these are still hardcore people. You know, yeah. you the Texas is the reason those guys were all in shelter and like one hundred and eight, and you know, yeah, yeah, yep. We, yep, yep. we don't get too far. We don't get too far. It's part of it. Yeah, it's part of it, man. Some hardcore dudes graduate and just try something new. And yeah. that's the beauty of it. That's what I did. I mean, look, I don't want to go write a Madball record. I want Madball to write a Madball record, you know? So mm -hmm. you know, I want to write a Felons record. I want to do my own fucking thing and and and, and still say, yo, I'm, I'm New York hardcore to, to the death. You know what I mean? I got a tattooed on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's that's my world, you know? So I'm always going to pull up to shows. Yo, shout out Terror, too, man. I think Terror is one of the best bands in the last 20 years, too, you know? like. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a band I fuck with heavy too, man. And I'm really, you know, I love the drummer. Luke's my guy, uh, Wisdom and Chains. Oh, they're they're my local band. They're Pennsylvania. Yo, fucking, yeah. All those dudes are so cool. Richie, Joe. Mm -hmm. Joe was helping me. He's he's a realtor. He was helping me look for a house in the Poconos. But Oh, yeah? You'd be yeah. my neighbor if you moved to the Poconos because I'm right, right, up, right up from it. Yeah, yeah. So my old guitar player lived in Carbondale. You know Carbondale? Yeah, it's right by me. All right, dope. Yeah, yeah. So I used to go out there a lot, but... 
Um, yeah, I was looking for trying to get, yeah, I still might. I got to talk to Joe. I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but Wisdom and Change is a cool fucking band, man. There's so many cool bands going on. Um, even uh, Departed, too, Joe Stanley's band. Mm-hmm. He's always doing son. You know, I, I respect that dude. He's always doing son. He put me on early, too. Me and Joe went back. You know, he, I remember he's throwing a show at AF. He's like, yo, I'll put you guys on. It, he was always a good dude. There's a lot of good dudes out in PA. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's like a little like uh, family kind of. But one time I played in Pittsburgh. That's a fucking drive, man. Yeah, Pitt. Well, Pittsburgh, you're going. You're going seven hours across Pennsylvania. My part of Pennsylvania, <sighs> you may as well be in Jersey or New York, where we're kind of like centralized. Yep, yep. And like the great part about growing up here was you were about two hours north. You're in New York. Two hours south. You're in Philly. Dope. You kind of can't lose. Yeah, you, you got a good good little metro there. Yeah, you could always. Yeah. I, I took a I took a buses out to Scranton before. You know, I used to, I've done shit like that from Manhattan. So I mean, it's not too far at all. Well, Pittsburgh though, I remember one time we did a little weekender, and it was like New York, Jersey, and, and Pittsburgh. And I'm like, all right, yeah, we'll do it. It's PA, yeah. and I'm like, what the fuck? Me and my boys are like, I'm like nodding at the wheel and shit. I'm like, yo, what the hell? This is a drive. We did it. We did it in one shot. So we went out to Pittsburgh. I said, yo, I'm going to fuck back. It was the last show of the weekend. I said, I'm going to fuck back home, man. Yep. You may as well be in Chicago at that point. Yeah, I'm like, dude, what am I driving? Ohio? This shit's crazy. Mm-hmm. But it was still cool. Pittsburgh's a cool city too. But tell, like, tell me the story where, like, all of this, like, the musically begins for you because it, it's all like, all of your output, uh, you know, like anything I can find, streaming wise, it's all within the past couple of years. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I mean, I'm sure maybe you've seen Ferrance and the Felons too, yeah. right? Okay, yes. okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I had a hardcore band called War Story, and we were active for maybe like four, three, four years. And uh, yeah, we just kind of took everything off the internet. We never really, it'd be like we'd do it hard for like six months and start playing, and people would start showing up, and like we were jumping on cool shows and play with Biohazard and this band and that band. But then, like, I'd get, like, flustered and in my head and be like, fuck this shit. I don't want to do it. I don't know. I was fighting some demons. But um, so, yeah, I still have the one day I think about, like, as felons grow as more and more, I'm going to, like, release some old hardcore shit, like, you know, under my own thing as felons. But, yeah, it was like 2018, 2017 when I was trying to get back into music. And, you know, I was like, dude, I, I got to play. My girl was like, dude, you got to start playing music again because you're fucking, you're insane to deal with. Um, <laughs> the truth about me is I do, I do work in heavy cement industry. And mm-hmm. um, that's, that's another uh, thing that really got me where I'm at in my life. It, it made me, it made me uh, money and it got me uh, decent things in my life. Um, so I still do that from, from time, you know, I'm not as full time with that, but I still help out my family a lot. Well, I say my family, but they're like my family. I yeah. still help out my family a lot because they they grew up really big. We grew a machine together where we haul cement and we do, you know, shit. Do we got 130 trucks now? I mean, oh, I can, I, shit. Like, yeah, we're we're one of the biggest cement distributors in the Northeast. So or I'm haulers. A, I'm I'm in a I'm in the plumbing industry. I've been a plumber okay. for like. 20 26 years oh shit all right yeah i i know the world that's and for you to have that kind of a fleet that's kind of a big deal yeah i mean we have like four yards right now shout out my boy billy man he started the company he's 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 closer to your age but yeah started with you know he's a high school dropout he's a truck driver he loved trucks and he's he said i'm gonna fucking start a business and when he had like you know i grew up with his younger brother we used to go to hardcore shows all the time and shit and uh I remember Billy, like my boy called me and he said, yo, you know, you're, you got the gift of gab. Like, you know, maybe you could come work, come work with me and help me because I'm more of an introverted dude. And I said, what's your plan? He said, I want to grow this shit into a beast. And at the time I was kind of doing music, but I was also looking for like some stability because, you know, I was done like figuring out how I'm going to pay my rent and shit. So yeah. I said, all right, I'll, uh, I'll work with you. We'll build this shit. And we built it into a monster. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to fully step away from that i'll always have some my hands in it somehow Mm -hmm. um but you know my passion is music and that's why i'm really back right now i'm pushing felons and 
you know, I'm in a position where I don't need a label because I have funding for myself, you know, and um, to any artist out there who I could give any piece of advice to who's younger, it's find a way to invest in yourself. If you really believe in what you're doing, you know, labels are going to give you a big network. They're going to open the doors for you, obviously, but you don't want nobody owning your masters, man. Not, I remember. Yeah, and that's, yeah, Nas said. Nas said the best piece of advice he ever got was from Prince. Mm-hmm. And uh, at Nas's biggest, he invited Prince to one of his record releases, and he said that Prince had actually showed up, and Nas was like ecstatic. He was like, "Holy shit!" Said he went up to Prince and he talked to him. I love Prince. I love you, man. I would love to collaborate with you. And Prince was like, "Absolutely," but let me ask you one question: Do you own your masters? And when Nas said, "Nah," I think you know Prince. He said Prince had said to him, "Like I, I, I wouldn't work with you if you don't own your masters." And Nas said that was like the greatest piece of advice he ever got. So when I heard that story through Nas, you know, through an interview, I'm like, wow, that really makes a lot of sense. I don't want to really give my rights away to somebody. Yeah. So to anybody out there doing it, you know, it's hard. I book, I book a lot of my, when, when we're getting ready to play again live, it's going to be early 2022, like spring. But like, I make sure I do it all myself. I, 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 if you were like, yo, Zach, I, I want to put you on a show. I'd be like, all right, I'm who you're dealing with. Yeah. You ain't going to go deal with a booking agent. I'm no, hell no. Yeah. My band's the same way. We don't, we don't have a booking agent. We don't do any of that. It's just, it's us. Okay, our, what's, what's your band? We're called hard out. Oh, dope. Dope. I got to check it out. All right. It's like, like, oi, oi, hardcore. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah, dude. Dope. You know? Yeah. I got to check it out. It's, you know, we, we have, we have our own label. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? yeah. we do our own thing because we're we're all so late in the game we're all in our with the exception of our bass player we're all in our 40s early 50s okay and we did it all we did all that yeah yeah and you're just doing it now for what it's really about and that's having fun and making the music and staying in the scene that you know you really got birthed in and yeah you know this times man i woke up to I, dude i woke up today i'm like yo am i too old to be doing this shit and then i was like fuck no like no, no i don't have no kids i really said i got i got 10 hard years in me man i'm gonna push hard for, I, i'm fucking gonna swing at the world for 10 years you know and uh really establish myself so i could that's my plan right man my plan is felons ain't going nowhere i'm i'm gonna really you'll see man i'm really starting to swing i gotta uh i'll tell you now since i'm talking to you um i got a single coming out in january mid-january and like Shit's about to get real. We 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 did a big production video. Uh, I got some cool PR working with me. It's it's a, for the first time too. It's a publicist that I'm personal. I know. I talk to the dude weekly. We're friends, you know. And he's very like particular about where he's trying to put me and you know how he's like, you know. We t- I love. I think he's awesome and and him and his partner are awesome because they deal with a lot of. Uh, artists personally there's no they both worked for bigger companies and then they both left and started their own thing and they're like yo we need to be on the phone with you we need to know where your head's at like what you're trying to do because a publicist i made the mistake in the past is they're kind of who's putting you in the public eye yeah and they're the ones that are going to say you know hey uh felons puts out new r&b track but my boy nick who's doing pr for me right now he's like yo, I know that you're New York hardcore. I want to talk about that shit. I want to get you on podcasts where people are talking about hardcore and metal and, and hip hop. And cause he's like, I don't want people to just think you're some dude making electronic music, you know? And, um, yeah, so I have a really cool team with me right now and it's all in house and I'm very, took a lot of work, took a lot of years of fucking up. Right. Yeah. But, that's the beauty of making mistakes. They're not, they're, they're only mistakes if you don't learn from them. So actually they were just lessons. Yeah. So there were hurdles. Yeah. They're hurdles, man. And we're here now. And like, we got a lot of cool shit after I hop off with you, I'm getting on a zoom with an artist from Canada who me and my brother Plancha might produce a record for. So like, we're doing like some different shit where, you know, we're like, dude, we ain't going nowhere. We're our own group. And you know, mm-hmm. Most of my day consists of like talking to my crew on the phone, whether it's in the cement industry or the art industry. I'm just, I'm a dude who's like, people are like, what do you do for the living? I'm like, I talk on the phone. Like, you're a hustler. 
yeah, I'm a hustler. So I'm like, yo, I got to maybe make a couple moves with the cement shit to make my bills, you know? But then right. I'm like, I'm always on the phone with Plancham or Cyber Creep or Flora or Blanco where I'm like, yo, like we need to get on this and we're doing this for this band and we're doing this collaboration. And so we're like, we're all like, yo, we're doing this by ourselves. Fuck that. Like we're going to, we're going to make a name for ourselves, you know? Mm-hmm. So what's the, tell me the story of at, at the very least sheep's wool, because that's, that's a track that, that has um, it, it's, it's, it's peeling back some layers. Yeah. Yeah. Opinion. Sheep's wool was like me and Plancham were, were in quarantine. We were, we were like working together. Like we were just friends. We were like making lo-fi music and um, he's like heavily influenced by like Linkin Park and R and B, and he didn't really know too much about like hardcore or metal. Mm-hmm. But uh, he had his own influences, and I was still doing the folk shit. And I I had this riff, you know, doing and I was writing the riff, and I, I wrote the lyric. I'm always a ways away. I was like, all right, this is kind of catchy. And I just went to his studio the next day, and I was like, yo, I got this riff, like, and this one line. And I played it for him and we were like, all right, dope. Like, this is cool. And we made like this demo of it. And uh, it actually was way shorter. It was only like a minute and a half long. We were creating like these ambient soundscape tracks. And I was working with my other buddy, Adam, who's a producer. He produces a lot of metal and like hardcore melodic bands. And I brought it to him and I said, yo, I got this track. And he said, yo, this track's dope. We should add a verse and we should like... And the funny thing about Sheep's Wool and everything I've done with this new felon shit, I write it on spot. I I literally go, okay, here's a bunch of lyrics that my head's producing at the moment. And then I listen to it for like five months and I'm like, oh, now I know what it means. Oh. So Sheep's Wool is, is actually, it was about a situation I was involved in um, where I had gotten... I was friends with this girl and she maybe caught feelings and like, you know, I was, it, it got complicated and she kind of pinned me as something specific. Like, Oh, you're being this way and this way and this way. And I was like, yo, what the fuck? Like, and I remember like maybe the next days when I wrote the song and looking back on it, sheep's wool is about what I see in society right now. A lot of people blindly following, you know, what the news is telling them or what the cell phones telling them. And me saying like, yo, I'm always like a ways away from that shit. Like, don't, don't confuse me with that shit, you know? So the lyrics to that song, I didn't know what they meant until I listened to it a hundred times. And now I could tell you. Because it was, it was stream of consciousness before that happened. Yeah. And it's like, please don't leave me on display. I'll bleed you out in shades. Like, don't, don't try to sit, don't tell me what I am, you know, cause I'll, I'll strip you down and you like mentally and you won't even know. So it was kind of like, that's for anybody that's get, feels like they're getting put in a box. Mm. Like don't put a, don't put a lion in, in a, in a sheep's wool, you know, don't try to do that or a wolf, you know, like, yeah, don't fucking do that shit. That's what that song is about, man. And is it kind of similar to um, situation, I guess, writing wise with cybernetic organism? cybernetic organism my boy rob dudge shout out he was in ferentz and the felons that's like family member sal he uh he's still involved in felons for sure he he was like yo i got this baseline and he had this baseline and yeah i just wrote the lyrics on spot and i was writing and writing and writing and one of my biggest obsessions in life for people that know me is terminator 2 uh Mm -hmm. it's my favorite film of all time but it's also like an identity i've kind of just like taken on Cause I love it so much. So the cybernetic organism is like my nickname in that sense. Uh, yeah. That song was just like kind of about like, what are we as people? And like, maybe we're turning into these machines. We're all like glued to these phones and we're trying to keep up with algorithms. And that song's that, you know, am I a fantasy? Like, or just a reoccurring dream inside my head? Like I'm sitting there like, Oh shit, if I if I post this, it's not gonna beat the algorithm. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm becoming like a terminator. Mm-hmm. So uh yeah, that all these songs happen, dude. Like I got I'm sitting on about 50 something tracks. Jesus. Yeah, I could send you so I could send you the new one that's coming out the 10th. 
that'd be that'd be amazing yeah i'll send you the the unlist i got the video uh ready too but it's um yeah there's new ones called decompose and it's it's got a lot of like nine inch nails vibes too unintentionally nice. but um well there's no there's nothing wrong with being confused with nine inch nails nah it's, nah trent's trent's is genius man he's smart dude um yeah i fuck with nine inch nails heavy too but yeah i mean i think after that i'm just gonna start rolling out like single after single after single i'm gonna play the singles game kind of like in the hip-hop mindset you're better off i think because it's easier to market and that's the way that's kind of the way everybody moves now yeah you know that's the wave i i mean it's it's a soundcloud based uh musical landscape where everybody everybody i talk to for the most part is moving that way like i'll drop one maybe two tracks yep yep let let that marinate for a month yeah and if i'm sitting on an album's worth of material or in your case five or six albums worth of material, <laughs> yeah and just deal that out deal that out incrementally every month every two three four weeks whatever yeah, exactly exactly i mean you're keeping people hungry yep you know uh, they don't have a chance to get sick of it and it, it's not like when I was a kid where you bought an album and you listen to the whole thing. You listen to the whole thing. You, yeah, you, yeah. you you consume the whole thing as an album. That doesn't exist anymore. And it really just doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. You know, I try because we're me and you grew up in that era of just digesting a whole record. Yeah. When I love an artist, I will still listen to the whole record. And like, uh, you know, there was a few albums that came out in like the last year or two where I was like, all right, yo, I've spun that whole record front to back like 20, 30 times, maybe 100 times, some of them. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The average consumer now has the attention span of a gnat. We're all looking for like 15 second TikTok videos. Mm -hmm. And it was funny with Sheep's Wool, one of my boys who's in uh, Lionheart, actually, he was like, oh, he nice. up, he's like, yo what the fuck dude like this song's so dope but why is it so short and i was like he's like i had to bump it like eight times i was like well then yo job done job like, done yeah because if it was 10 minutes long if it was a metallica song you'd be like fuck this shit like we, we can't all be neurosis neurosis no, yeah, makes exactly. fucking 15 20 minute epics of of, of dirgy hardcore psychosis yep but there's only one of them yeah and that's their niche and they're legendary yeah. for doing that yeah you know so neurosis and, and bands like that where they're just like fuck you i'll put out a 30 minute song that's what like their listener wants yeah but you know in this like day and age and, and dude to be honest it's i have one song that's probably like seven minutes long but the the thing about it is is like i'm even a dude who wants like a i'm a hardcore kid so i love a two minute song yeah, of you course. Know? So I'm like fucking most of the new felon shit's like two, three minutes max. But um Yeah, we're from the era of like the eight to ten song seven inch. Yeah, dude. Like give me like, you know, give me a ten song record, like satisfaction is death of desire is like twenty five yeah. minutes long. Yeah. You know, it's like give me a minute and a half song. I'm cool with that. But um yeah, so that's that's something I've even thought of when people are like, Oh wow, yeah, you're keeping up with the times. I'm like, nah, I'm just doing what hardcore bands would do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, straight up just straight to the point and just get out, you know. Yeah, Discharge didn't have a song over a minute like 45 from for most of their career until they got a little weird, you know. Exactly, so, exactly. It's cool, man. Do whatever the fuck you want is what my motto is. So Yeah, but if you keep people wanting more. Yeah, that, that's that's mission accomplished. It's hard enough, you know, I, you play into the mental game of like, you know, I'll put out a song and it's like, yeah, I hope people like it. I used to be like, so like, I hope it gets, does well. And you think like, for me, I'm like, when I specifically like Sheep's Wall, I remember I was like, yo, this song's a banger. Like I, I was so proud of it. And Planchin was proud. We were like proud of it. And I'm like, yo, I got to give this like the proper care. And like, I hope like it gets, you know, I'm putting numbers on shit. I hope it gets this. And I'm like, wait, what the fuck? I don't give a fuck. Like, yeah, it's not about that. It's about, yeah. cur it's about curation. It's about putting it in the right hands. You know, where, where the people like, like people who are fucking obviously cool and not, yeah. you know what I mean? Like if cool people are listening to it and, and co-signing it, that's, that's worth, it. that's worth so much more 
than anything else. Than, like, than sheeps following yeah, it. You yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So it, it actually was cool, man. I actually had a really good organic like response to it. And like you said, it was a lot of people who I genuinely know and like really good people. Like, yo, this this track slaps. So I bumped it 10 times today. And I'm like, oh, dope, dope. You know, people were like sharing it a bunch on social media. And I was that's, like, wow. That's why I reached out to you because it 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 jumped out to me. It's it dope. It How did you flat. even find my show? I'm curious, you know. Yeah, uh, you know what you got suggested to me on Instagram. And I liked the way it looked. I mean, I saw a picture of you with a knife next to your mouth and blood and, and you're wearing a flight jacket. And I'm like, this dude looks like a psychotic skinhead who just like is a vampire or some shit. <laughs> I want to know what that's about. Yeah, yeah. Dope, dope, dope. So, so I opened it up, went down the rabbit hole. And then I saw a picture of you with like a, a New York hardcore beanie. I'm like, all right, he's from my world. I'm going to like this even more now. Yeah. Then, yeah. I, then I heard it. And you know everything i like is very disparate cool like cool, i said I, I like like from from hardcore to industrial music to hip-hop i mean that's to r&b and bob dylan like it's all in there Fuck and, yeah. and, and you have that same stew going on in 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 your world so yeah, I mean, yeah. what's not to like for me that's awesome, dude. Power of the internet, man. You can now mm -hmm. you consider you somebody I know, a friend, you know, somebody yeah. who's doing something cool. And that, that's the awesome part about this cybernetic organism that we're becoming is is the utilization of, you know, the technology for the better, which is connecting with some dude that's, you know, two hours away from me. And uh, we like a lot of the same shit and we know a lot of the same people and the same world. And, and that's the beauty of all this. And, and it's really cool just connecting with you too, man. And like, this doesn't stop here. You know, we're always going to keep in touch. And yeah, you know, I got to fucking, I got to get better at like some people will follow me and I'll be like, Oh shit. Cool. And then I'll think like, oh, I got to check them out. Like right now I realized I don't even follow you back. So I'm following you back. Cause I'm yeah. like, I have no idea what this shit sometimes. Well, Zach, it's hard. It's, yeah. it's, it's fucking hard to do. And, and you know, that's, that's why there's no, there's the, like, I don't feel any kind of way about it because it's difficult. There's a lot of people who follow me. I don't follow them back just because I'm not, I'm not thinking about it. I mean, let's face facts. I used to write a zine. Okay. Okay. And that's where the impetus of this podcast comes from. I even call it a pod zine because I see a, that. I see that. It's a fanzine, dude. This is a fanzine, but we're, we're talking in real time. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, it's, it's more human. And I think what I'm trying to do is make like, like posit something organic inside of the cybernetic organism. Yep. 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 Exactly, bro. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. And it's really cool what you're doing, man. I, I really like it. And I really respect you. that you're, you're, you're telling your story and, and I seen on your Instagram about different shit you talk about and, you know, you're open about addiction and things like that. And that's yeah. fucking awesome, man. I mean, I got to send you some, some gear, man. You got to send me your address. I got to send you some felon stuff so you could, sport it out there i'll send you a ball of clava and a beanie because it's getting cold yeah and uh yeah man let's let's definitely keep linking up and i'm looking to eventually get out to the scranton area and obviously play and stuff so oh, i'll put i'll put a show right on for you that's not even a deal yeah hell yeah let's do it man and you know i gotta i gotta do this um at nine o'clock i gotta do this meeting on zoom so yeah, I hate to cut it short because no, the conversation's so good, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah, man, it was it was honestly such a pleasure, and and this is cool, man. This is what it's all about is just connecting with people and you know really getting it out there. There's no uh, fuck the ego, man. I don't want to just I want to. It's always going to be there as like a devil to get in your way. Yeah, but you know I I always try to keep myself humble. You know, like I'm nobody. I'm I'm no better than the next person, and you're no better than me. We're yep. all equal on this playing field, man. Whether you're caught up in a loop, whether you're locked up, whether you're <laughs> mentally locked up, yeah, we're all we've all been there. We're all gonna head back there. We, you know, <laughs> we're we're all in the same world. But real yep. quick, I want to ask you, uh, I want to ask you a question. Yeah, top five, top five favorite hardcore records. Go. All right, let's do this. Blood, sweat, no tears. Sick of it all. Don't. It put me where I'm from. It'll always be where I'm at. I have to follow that up uh, with corrosion and conformity, eye for an eye. Nope. Uh, thereafter would probably be uh, agnostic front. Uh, 
so one voice. Yep. I'm going to move directly thereafter into, oh God, this is so tough because hardcore has been my life for like almost 35 years. Uh, <laughs> um, Gorilla Biscuits start today Dope. for sure, for sure. Uh, and then uh, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be Youth of Today disengage. There you go, man. And you know what? What we'll do is we'll do this again, and I'll start off the episode, the next episode with my top five. Sounds fucking dope. Let's Absolutely. do that, man. Yo, Absolutely. bro, it was a pleasure. Yes, brother. I really respect you reaching out, and, and now we connected, and we're 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 in the same frequency, man. We could always rock together. So, yeah, any buddy. time when you're ready to post this, I don't know when you post it. Just let me know. I'll blast it out. You know what I mean? Appreciate and, it, man. And I'll get it. I'll get some people to definitely tune into what you're doing too, man. I really respect it, it bro. One Thank love, you, man. Too. One voice. Peace out, brother. Peace, brother. Peace, brother. Night. That was Zach of Felons. Thank you all so very much for sitting with us, for enjoying, and just for being you. This has been the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. He's been Zach. I've been Peter. You've been fantastic. Please come and sit with us again. Have a great holiday. One love to one and all. And I can't wait to sit with you all again. Good night, everyone.